this video will deal with the hundred years between 1650 and around 1760. During this time, a wealth of European philosophy, which significantly informs the American Revolution, uh, is born. We'll start first with Thomas Hobbes and move on from there. Hobbes, in a text called The Leviathan, attempts to theorize what society would have been like before the first governments, before the first laws. And he describes this situation as a state of nature. It is a time when life is poor, nasty, brutish, and short. When everything is red in tooth and claw, meaning very bloody. And it's a situation of a war of each against all with no laws, with no government, with no police, or even military. Anyone only survives so long as they can personally defend themselves. They can only amass as much uh, wealth or even food as they can personally defend. And so, the second one is incapable of defending one's life uh, or uh, possessions, they are lost. Thus, life is violent, um, animalistic, and impoverished. Seeing that this would be an unpleasant circumstance to live under, Hobbes theorizes in his thought experiment that people would bind together in what he calls a social contract. This is the first time in the modern period we are discussing the social contract, but a number of thinkers will deal with it in detail. The idea of the social contract is quite simplistically expressed. I've paraphrased it as follows, that people give up individual liberties in exchange for mutual security or safety. In our society, for example, I give up my perfect liberty and freedom to fire a gun wildly into the air so that you don't either and we're all safer because bullets don't rain down on all of our heads similarly I give up my right to drive at 120 miles an hour down the road so that you don't either and we're all safer as a result In that context, it's worthwhile to think through uh, the Second Amendment to the American Constitution. We could reasonably ask, in the context of a social contract, if giving up some liberties to firearm possession would indeed make us safer. There's interesting arguments on both sides about that, uh, and historical as well as geographical examples, uh, as well as um, reputable scientific study that suggests that those countries which limit access to firearms uh, 
really do have reduced gun violence. Now, there are some other moving parts in that argument, but we could reasonably think through it. We should also note that the legal precedent in Supreme Court case history is that the well-regulated militia part of the Second Amendment really does mean well-regulated and, and official militia, what we would call today the National Guard. I've mentioned it once before, and I mention it again now. An article in a legal scholarly journal titled Arms, Anarchy, and the Second Amendment. Very easy for you to find online. Which makes the claim, and I leave you to adjudicate rightly or wrongly, that the purpose of the Second Amendment was to allow the states to have armies, National Guards, so that the federal government wasn't the only political entity with an army. The purpose of the Second Amendment is to maintain a National Guard. The individual right to bear arms is a recent interpretation, uh, largely lobbied for by the NRA and gun manufacturers they represent, who perpetuate the idea, if not myth, that we live in a dangerous world and thus need to be ready to shoot our neighbor at a moment's notice. The fact that there are any limitations on gun rights at all, not to mention the variety of them, goes to show that the right on individual citizens absolutely can be infringed. Uh, permitting, uh, limits, bans, all of these have been held constitutional repeatedly. And um, forbidding any um, significant judicial uh, change, uh, they will continue to be upheld. For Hobbes, though, the purpose of a society is to ensure to the greatest extent possible that people do not have to live in a constant fear of violent death. That's the purpose of society. If someone lives in a society or a community in which there is significant reason to fear violent death, then that society is not living up to its most fundamental purpose. I think we could do well for all of us to pause and chew on that. What you see on the right half of your screen is what's called the frontispiece, or the cover artwork for Hobbes's Leviathan. In this frontispiece, you see coming over the horizon like a Godzilla or enormous monster, a figure like a man, looming hundreds of feet tall. This image represents the idea expressed in the text of the Leviathan. The Leviathan is the state, or the body politic. What you might be able to see is that his body is actually made out of people, 
what this helps us uh, comprehend is that the state of Texas, for example, is not the geographical boundaries of the state of Texas. It's us. It's we the people. Similarly, for the United States, the United States of America is not its geographical boundaries. It is we, the people, we the Americans. So ideas of a government of the people, by the people, for the people, um, get some of their uh, theoretical foundation and philosophical foundation here, but also elsewhere, as we'll see shortly. One of the liberties that we give up in a society, according to Hobbes, is the right, but also the obligation to uh, pursue justice for ourselves and by ourselves. We hand over the right to bear the sword to someone else who will do it on our behalf. Now, this is a great benefit. If you're a frail 80-year-old person and someone steals your property, you don't have to go get it back from the gang members yourself. Instead, you can call the police, the arm of justice, to administer justice on your behalf, to do the dangerous work of the fighting. So you don't have to. But it also means that even if you wanted to, you're not allowed to be a vigilante. You don't get to be Batman and go administer justice as you see fit. We hand over not only the right to bear the sword, uh, the right of execution, to the designated members of the society, but we also give up the right to decide ourselves to a figurehead. We give it up to a king, a magistrate, a judge, a congress, or a president. And this ability to have disputes arbitrated is a bit of a burden because we don't always get what we want and we have to abide by the will of others. But that's the price of living in a civilized society. Is that instead of coming to blows over disputes, we can go to court. So long as we agree to abide by the outcome the judge or jury decides. And by we, I mean we as members of a society. There is one interesting complication, particularly noted by 20th century female philosopher Ayn Rand, which is that in fact, the social contract is no contract at all. You and I never signed on the dotted line. Perhaps, if we don't like this society, we can just leave. If we don't like the country, we can get out. But we're at a new point in human history where there's nowhere left to go. There is not a single place on planet Earth that is not spoken for by a governmental system. In the 1700s and 1800s, the idea of manifest destiny, which has all sorts of negative, uh, 
colonialistic um, implications also functioned as a sort of release valve on social pressure. People who didn't like the government could go west to escape its oppressive thumb to the frontier. But now, all frontiers are closed. There is no escape valve to let off steam. How we will deal with this um, remains to be seen and is likely up for us to decide, uh, individually and in aggregate. Lastly, one of the foundational ideas that Locke, I'm sorry, that Hobbes is credited with involving American political philosophy is the idea of the separation of church and state. You can see it represented uh, graphically or in terms of an image here. On the one side we have castles, and kings, and instruments of war. On the other side, churches, popes, and the instruments of peace and clergy. We also see in the image at the top a wall of separation between the churches out between the fields and the countryside and the governmental buildings, the barracks, and the military uh, personnel. This political philosophical idea we can largely credit to Hobbes. Its appropriateness was as obvious as it was radical in the 1650s. Now, 350 years later, Perhaps we're beginning to forget how oppressive the perfect mixture of religion and politics often is. Pascal puts us on a different tangent. we're beginning to bring to a close the debates and especially proofs, arguments, and attempts at persuasion in the canonical history of Western philosophy about belief in God, specifically the God of Christianity. I mention that especially because this type of argument called a wager, specifically Pascal's wager, depends upon ignoring every other religion exists. In the European world of the 1670s, that was still considerably possible. But already, and increasingly, as we continue forward in time, it becomes less and less possible to be so intellectually insular or isolated. ocean-going vessels and shipbuilding technology, sailing technology, trade from uh, the Eastern world to the Western world, and now across the Atlantic, colonialism in Africa, uh, 
all of which is continuing to make it more and more obvious to Europeans that Christianity is one religion among many. This will be a challenge for Christianity to make sense of, and Christian cultures. But that is the context of the Renaissance, a growing awareness of the order of the world. Pascal makes a different sort of argument for belief in God. It's based on what a gambler would do, or what a prudent betting person would bet on. He identifies, simplistically, that there are two possibilities. One possibility, that God exists. The other, that God does not exist. And in response to these two possibilities, which we cannot control, we personally have two options. We can either act like we are believers and faithful that God exists, or we can do the opposite and not act like we're believers. Then all we have to do is fill out the Punnett square like when you're doing a genealogy or her hereditary map. If it turns out that God exists and we've been faithful believers, our reward is infinite. Perfect happiness forever. If it turns out that God exists and we've not been believers, the punishment and damnation is infinite. Infinite torture. Infinite unhappiness. If it turns out that God does not exist, and we've been believers, we still get some good out of it. Maybe we lived a long, clean, healthy life because we were very ethical. People liked us and trusted us, and that benefited us socially. But it also has some drawbacks. In economics, we call these opportunity costs. Turns out we wasted our time going to church. We didn't have to get up so early. We wasted our money paying tithes that ultimately benefited us nothing. And when the cute swinger couple down the street had that swinger party, turns out we could have gone and we missed out. But perhaps also we benefited because the people who went to the swinger party wound up with sexually transmitted diseases. And by being good, puritanical people, we had the benefit of missing out on those. Lucky for us. Either way, we're dead in the ground, uh, but there's some good and some bad that accrues to us. If it turns out that God does not exist, and we've not been believers, we again have some benefits and some drawbacks. One benefit is that we sway saved 10% of our income by switching to atheism. We didn't have to get up early for church on Sunday mornings, but maybe we drank too much, partied too hard, and wound up with um, liver cirrhosis, and died of alcoholism at a young age. Maybe people didn't trust us because we lied and cheat and stole, and so we wind up dead or in prison. Maybe we go to the swinger party, but we wind up with an STD. Either way, we're dead in the ground, but 
the costs and benefits are mixed. So all that remains for us to do is decide. We can't control whether God exists or not. All we can control is our behavior. Now, imagine you are going to Windstar Casino or Vegas. And you're going to play roulette. And if you put your money on red and red wins, you win a million dollars. But if you put your money on black and red wins, you have to pay a million dollars. And the most you could get if black wins is one dollar. You get one lifetime worth of good. As opposed to an infinite number of lifetimes worth of good. Only the fool would bet on black. There's no benefit to it. Or the benefits are small. The negatives are immense. Whereas voting on red, the believer in our example, has huge payoffs and only tiny drawbacks. So the wise gambler, the prudent and rational gambler, would obviously choose belief. What this neglects to analyze are two things. One, which God does one believe in? The God of Christianity? Judaism and not Christianity? Islam instead of both? The many, many gods of Hinduism? The agnostic religious philosophy of Buddhism? Or Zeus? Or uh, Jupiter? Or uh, Odin? Or Quetzalcoatl? The Mesoamerican wind serpent deity? Or Pele, god of volcanoes? Or the indigenous African deities? In order to really make a determination, we would have to have many, many, many more rows and columns of belief or not belief in this God or that God or a different God. Secondly, Pascal's wager likely suffers from another type of flaw. Which is, it encourages a sort of fake it till you make it, which Pascal says is a good thing. Or even more importantly, this basis for belief is incredibly selfish and self-interested. It's what we sometimes call fire insurance. We don't want to get burned, so we choose the opposite. Likely, the purpose of Christianity is not, what can I get out of belief? But, I am persuaded that I must worship a god, the god. That it's about the god, not about the lowly individual. However, it does also help display the way that religions which work in this way operate according to a sort of carrot and stick motivational scheme. We want the dangled cupcake of heaven before our eyes. And we want to avoid 
the painful lash of the devil's whip at our hindquarters. This is a semi-effective motivation. As Plato had pointed out, uh, so long as it's believed. The second it's not, it loses all persuasiveness and teeth. Baruch Spinoza later has his name changed to Benedict Spinoza. The reason why is because he had been excommunicated from his Jewish community in Portugal because of his radical ideas about how one might or should define God. This poses an interesting question again for us, one which we had seen before in our discussion of Socrates. Should you have the ability to define God as you see fit? Or do you merely have to believe as everyone else around you believes? In a dense and challenging text titled The Ethics, Spinoza's philosophy has been referred to as either pantheism or pan in theism. Pantheism is defined as the idea that God is everything, and vice versa, that everything is God. Perhaps more specifically, Spinoza's philosophy should be defined as pan in theism where God is in everything, or vice versa, everything is in God. Spinoza's philosophy is described as monistic for this reason. There's only one thing that exists, and that thing is God. And so everything around us is God. The pencil and the pen the laptop and the automobile, the wind and the trees and the sky, and the squirrels and the beetles and the caterpillars, all of that is God. You can see how this might have been perceived as heretical by a traditionally conservative believing community to claim that a pin is God or God is in a pin is too much likely to claim that God is in me is an idea we're comfortable with to be like Jesus and claim I am God that we that becomes dangerous. One of the phrases as a most particular sticking point in Latin would be Deus sive natura, which in English would mean God or nature. Spinoza's monism seems to be expressing the idea that God and nature are identical, or that nature is God. Usually there is a dualism between creator and creation that in our discussion of Hinduism had been collapsed.
likely uh, traditionally believing Christians today would call this creation worship or far too close to paganism, nature worship. But one of the most fascinating implications of this philosophy is that if we define God as nature, nature is not especially loving or caring. Nature can be often mean, violent, cruel, apathetic, horrific, terrifying, careless, and very often extraordinarily dumb, stupid, and unintelligent. If we apply the labels mean, apathetic, violent, horrifying, stupid, and unintelligent to God, you see precisely why this collapsing of a traditionally dualistic metaphysical conception into a monistic one is intellectually, culturally, and socially dangerous. Which is why Spinoza is banished for being far too radical for his community. He escapes the death that Jesus and Socrates had found. One final implication of this Deus Siwe Natura, God or Nature, would be that if God and Nature are one and the same, the nature at its most ultimate aggregate, the universe, would simply be God. If God is the universe, we could say that this is where we come from and why we're here, that it's all around us. But loving, good, decent, just, caring or intelligent, Maybe not. I simply put Isaac Newton on these slides to represent the power of the application of math to nature. John Locke, even though his philosophy is rich and valuable, I'll deal with uh, quite briefly in a text called The Essay Concerning Human Understanding. Locke provides counter-argument to René Descartes. Descartes had argued that there were such a thing as innate ideas. Locke argues the opposite, that there are no innate ideas. That the human mind upon birth is like a blank slate, a clean chalkboard. In Latin, a tabula rasa, in Locke's English language, simply, like a white sheet of paper. John Locke is doing something akin to what we would call today childhood psychological development. He's trying to explain 
How do we learn? He's dealing in epistemology. How do we come to know what we know? Locke's answer is from experience. This makes him an empiricist, and his philosophy a type of empiricism. The idea is that when we're born, we know nothing. No innate ideas, certainly no knowledge of God. And then, as we have experiences, we tally them up on the chalkboard of the mind. And then, after having gained many experiences, we can refer back to them as a guide for future action. In the following few slides, I'll allow you a brief moment to compare John Locke's second treatise of government with the Declaration of Independence for the United States of America. And what you'll see is that the founding fathers of this country not only knew their cutting edge European philosophy, the philosophy in vogue of their day, but put those ideas into practice, literally plagiarizing them. The result is the United States of America is the single most philosophical system of politics on earth. Its origin is purely cutting edge philosophy. If you so desire, I'll turn your attention to Locke's letter concerning toleration, which makes an argument for um, diversity of faith, belief, and religious practice, foundational to the political philosophy of our nation. However, even Locke, the practicing Puritan, who doesn't want to be oppressed by official dogma of Catholicism, I believe still stops short of allowances for freedom for non-believers. Whether that's a function of his cultural context or a personal prejudice or just simple unwillingness, I'll leave for you to investigate. If you so desire, I'll give you the opportunity to pause the video lecture so you can read in comparison and contrast between Locke and the Declaration of Independence. But that's primarily for your own personal edification or enjoyment. This table was borrowed from a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin by the last name of Somerville. The original source is found at the bottom. As we cross into the 1700s, I'll deal briefly with Bishop Barclay. He is the person whom Berkeley, California is named after. The appropriate pronunciation is closer to Barclay, 
but that's largely unimportant. He is a clergy within the Catholic Church. This is a title. Notice that he, too, is interested in epistemology. How do we know what we know? And his philosophy is also grouped as a form of empiricism. However, Barclay allows us to answer what I sometimes call a toy question. Fun to play with, not especially important. He allows us to answer the age-old if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Barclay's answer, yes. The reason why? Because God hears it. Ha, huh, done. Simple as that. Make sense of it for you? The Latin phrase, esse est percipi, either means to be is to perceive, or to be is to be perceived, or that uh, existence is perception. What is meant by this is something like, God is constantly maintaining every bit of existence in its appropriate relationship to every other bit of existence in all of nature. That it's sheer force of God's mind that keeps all the atoms in their place and all the stars and planets in their motion. Which, of course, is no effort for the divine at all. But without which nothing would be. This is, to a large extent, an attempt to answer a philosophical difficulty known as object permanence. When I leave a classroom at night and all the doors to the university are locked up behind me, how do I know that the table and the chairs don't just disappear when no one's looking. Barclay's answer, God is watching them. I like to use other cute examples, like how do you know the lime and the coconut aren't doing a tango in the fridge when you turn out the light? God is watching them. How do you know that the toys in the children's toy chest aren't getting up and plotting the communist revolution while no one is home. God is watching them and keeping them good capitalist patri uh, patriotic Americans. But because this makes little difference to our daily lives, I'll move on briefly. We had already dealt to a significant extent with the debates Leibniz had brought up when we had discussed the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus. Leibniz, in a text called the Theodicy, which refers to the problem of evil, argues that our world is the best of all possible worlds because it provides us free will. And that a world with free will and because of it evil is better than a world with no free will and accordingly no evil. That certainly can be debated. We had had a variety of debates in our examination of Epicurus. Leibniz's argument is that free will is such a good thing. It makes up for all the bad consequences it creates. 
go ahead. Reason through this one, if you dare. Is free will so good that it justifies childhood molestations and rapes and murders, as well as genocides? While Leibniz can argue that, whether he's right, persuasive, or convincing, uh, is um, considerably more a matter left to further debate and perhaps individual taste. One final consequence as we at long last end the debate about free will and its association with evil and its existence would be when people say everything happens for a reason. Last semester, I had a student from a devout religious family who had a brother who, during the semester, while in his teenage years, died of childhood cancer. You can imagine the struggle of a family dealing with that. If we imagine, as likely was the case, someone came up to this family and said, everything happens for a reason. What they mean is that this person's childhood cancer and this family's uh, heartbreaking drama actually serves a good purpose. We see this politically in discussions of rape babies. The considerably unpleasant arguments one sometimes hears that although rape is an evil, a baby is a blessing. This is a way of expressing that there's a good reason or that it's all a part of God's plan. Whether God's plan and free will goes together, I leave that for you to ponder also. But is childhood cancer actually serving a good purpose? Do rapes actually benefit people? To maintain that everything happens for a supposedly good reason, one would have to suggest that childhood cancer is a good thing because it makes the family more faithful, or that rapes are good things because it, it teaches people to uh, trust in God and um, provides the blessing of unwanted children. Hopefully you can hear the skepticism in my voice. Whether everything happens for a reason or a good reason is debatable. And in terms of philosophy, our job is to think through the logical conclusions of our ideas. And that would be at least one way in which we could approach that idea. I could go on uh, attempting to explain in more detail, but I'll leave off for now. Briefly mention one of the single most confusing texts in the history of philosophy called the Monadology. Uh, simply put, uh, to make something ridiculously complex, ridiculously simple. The monadology, I think, if I understand it to any degree, is attempting to explain the interrelatedness of everything in existence. That's fine. <laughs>
but let's go on. Two last philosophers to deal with briefly, and we will have accomplished our goal for this um, uh, voluminous video. David Hume is a radical Scottish philosopher who in a number of texts of relevance to us expresses a few ideas that I'd like to impress upon you and emphasize. The first is called the is-ought fallacy sometimes overlapped with the naturalistic fallacy or called Hume's fork. Simply put, Hume's is-ought fallacy or is-ought dichotomy expresses one cannot derive an ought from an is or a, fact, uh, a value from a fact. One cannot say what should be the case because of what is the case. If you know what a normative statement is, you cannot derive a normative value from a statement of fact or something descriptive. Take an example to make better sense of this. Often there's an argument that homosexuality is unnatural, therefore it is immoral. This commits Hume's is-ought fallacy or naturalistic fallacy. Whether or not homosexuality is unnatural, that provides us no information whatsoever about whether it's moral. There are all sorts of things that are natural, such as murder, rape, childhood cancer, that are not moral, especially if I inflict them upon you. AIDS is quite natural. It wasn't invented. It's not artificial. But if I knowingly infect you with AIDS, I've done something incredibly immoral. If you didn't want to be infected. Similarly, there are all sorts of things that are unnatural that are very moral. Antibiotics are artificial. They're almost certainly moral. You'd be hard-pressed to argue otherwise. The eyeglasses that I wear didn't grow on a tree, but they have no problem of morality. clothing itself didn't grow like on a shirt hanger from a, a t-shirt tree but many people consider modesty moral it turns out that homosexuality is incredibly natural there are multiple examples throughout the animal kingdom. You've likely seen your dog do it for dominance. There's also a species of chimpanzee called the pygmy chimpanzee, or bonobo, which has been recorded um, engaging in homosexual orgies regularly. Uh, however, that provides no information whatsoever about its morality. Um, the, 
the normal chimpanzee, pan troglodytes, troglodytes, um, is well known for going on war bans and murdering members of their own community or neighboring communities for no reason other than a lust for violence or to reduce competition. When we do the same thing as humans, it's always immoral. So, whether homosexuality is the most natural thing in the world or entirely artificial, that tells us nothing about its moral appropriateness or its value. David Hume, furthermore, takes a sort of skepticism to its ultimate conclusion, arguing that although we think we understand causality, we don't, perhaps can't. However, we think we do because of being accustomed to things working in a particular way or because we are habituated to seeing things work in a way we call cause and effect. That habit or habituation uh, Hume accurately identifies, probably, is not knowledge. It's um, bias, prejudice. It's belief, but not actually understanding. But David Hume's skepticism can also be found in a considerable antagonism towards the dominant religion of his society. The Inquisition will end in Europe less than a hundred years from now. And what David Hume finds fit to publish, I've excerpted for you here, that if we take in our hand any volume of divinity, and we ask, does it contain any facts or science? That if not, it is a waste and should be burned as useless to human society. That is the most uh, unpleasant approach uh, to traditional religious belief and sacred texts that we've seen so far. However, it's a step towards what's coming, which is outright disparagement of the religious and metaphysical systems that had been so influential politically ethically, culturally, and socially for so long in the Western world. In less than 150 years, Darwin will have significantly contradicted the book of Genesis, and Nietzsche will take that up as a sword to sever a relationship between the Western world and Christianity to the best of his ability. And all philosophy after that point takes that as starting point. The last philosopher to discuss in this long video, and thank you for your patience. After all, you signed up for this. is Jean-Jacques Rousseau.
Rousseau, along with John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, were intimately interested in social contract theory. What Rousseau adds to this discussion deals with what he calls the general will. The general will is the basis for what we call a system of government by majority or majority rule. Simply put, if 50% of a society plus one wants something done, that's what should be done because that's what most people want. To put this into context, if 50% of society plus one think gay marriage should be legal, then gay marriage should be legal. If not, then not. If 50% of people plus one want marijuana to be legal, then marijuana should be legal. If not, then not. The same thing on abortion. The great question, which Rousseau engages, but if my reading of him is accurate, likely does not manage to fully and finally uh, deal with, is how can we, or should we, protect the interests of minorities from the tyranny of the majority? I'll state it again so it can sink in. How can we protect the interests of the minorities from the tyranny of the majority. In our political system of society, we have the Bill of Rights and the Constitution as a whole. The fascinating question is, is that sufficient? Is that enough? As we get closer and closer to the present, what we'll find is that we're racking up questions that are still yet to be answered. Another of them deals with what he calls the origin and basis of inequality. Questions of the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots the 1% and the 99% are coming into fashion, are beginning to be of intellectual concern. This process will be continued with um, Thomas Jefferson, as we'll see shortly, dramatically by Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto, and socialist revolutions, and even most recently into the political rhetoric of um, Occupy Wall Street and Bernie Sanders. This question, what do we do about income or wealth inequality, is still one of the greatest that are crying out for answers. What I often tell my students is that, number one, if you manage to answer it, you'll be remembered by history. You'll be extraordinarily famous in the way few people are. And number two, if you personally are not able to answer this question, if you choose to raise children, you might raise your children in such a way that they might have a basis for answering this question. It's likely one of the most important in the world. 